this is Craig Brown, and welcome to Passages. Passages is a space to explore Bible passages used for preaching, reflection, and prayer. My hope is that Passages will shine a unique light on text used for preaching here at the First Free Methodist Church in Seattle, or anyone looking to dive deeper into the Bible. Today's passage is Acts chapter 10, verses 23 to 35. It's the basis for the sermon here at First Free Methodist Church on July 30, 2023. It's the first message in our new series called Serve the World, as we explore a healthy, mutual life of a mission. We're dropped in this text into the middle of a a longer story that occupies almost all of Acts chapter 10. And for this particular's particular uh, episode, we're only covering uh, the ending of verse 23 through verse 35, which is the same section of text uh, we'll be having the sermon on uh, July 30th from. So let's start at that second part of verse 23. I'm reading from the 2020 revision of the New American Standard Bible. So here we go. Now on the next day, he got ready and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. On the following day, he entered Caesarea, and now Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter helped him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. And he talked with him, and he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know that it is forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or to visit a foreigner. And yet God has shown me that I am not to call any person unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. So I ask, for what reason did you send me? Verse 30, Cornelius said, Four days ago to this hour I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in shining clothing. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your charitable gifts have been remembered before God. Therefore, send some men to Joppa to invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent men to you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear everything that you have been commanded by the Lord. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. This is a rich story in Acts chapter 10. I invite you to read the entire chapter in this exchange between Cornelius and Peter. For the sake of this podcast, we're only beginning at verse 23, which is the moment at which Peter actually arrives at Cornelius' home and their conversation begins together. Cornelius had a vision that he describes that was given to him by God, and this vision was for him to send emissaries to visit Peter in Joppa. Now, where Caesarea is, is uh, along the coast, and so is Joppa. So he basically sends people a good number of miles down the coast, and to visit Peter and to bring him back to Caesarea. Joppa is an interesting place for Peter to have this vision about going to Cornelius's home. Cornelius is a Gentile. He's a Roman centurion. He's a commander in, in the Roman army. And so it's somewhat odd that Peter would have this call to go to Cornelius's home. But what's interesting is Joppa is the very same place where the prophet Jonah ran away from God's call to also go to the Gentiles. And it's from Joppa that he embarked in a boat and went out to sea where there's a great storm. And then, as you know, Jonah, according to the story, swallowed by a fish and spat up on the beach back in Joppa. And then he had to decide if he was actually going to go to Nineveh or not. So the parallels between Acts chapter 10 and the story of Jonah are rich. So the question here that Peter has to wrestle with is, will he accept the call that Jonah originally rejected. It says when they arrive in Joppa, Cornelius's guests receive Peter's hospitality, and they stay the night, and then the next day, 
Peter leaves with Cornelius's emissaries, along with some of the brothers who were in Joppa with Peter. Now they travel along the coast and they're going from south to north at this point, from Joppa to Caesarea. And sometimes people get confused in the Bible, especially in New Testament, when they read about Caesarea. There's Caesarea Philippi, which is up in the mountains north of the Sea of Galilee, and there's Caesarea Maritima. This is where Peter is headed. It's straight up the coast, and Caesarea Maritima is a palace that was built by Herod the Great for the Roman governor. And so the Roman governor didn't have uh, the, the headquarters in Jerusalem, where Pilate would visit, of course, during the moment of Jesus' uh, condemnation to death and crucifixion. Rather, Caesarea Maritima was the headquarters because it was right along the coast, so it was easy for the Roman governor to get in a boat and go back to Rome or to other provinces as they might have uh, occasion to do. Cornelius is there. So Cornelius being a centurion, he's in Caesarea Maritima. He sends for Peter down the coast in Joppa. Peter then now returns. Now Cornelius, it says in this story, called together his relatives and his close friends and that he was expecting Peter's return. Uh, Peter's arrival. Uh, Cornelius wants everybody to hear from Peter. He wants everybody there to engage in hearing the message that Peter has that Cornelius has never heard Peter before. He was simply called by God to summon Peter to come. Now, Cornelius is what's called a God-fearing Gentile. Now, this is a distinction that's made amongst people, especially within the New Testament and in the book of Acts. A God-fearing Gentile is a Gentile who believes in the Jewish God, but has not yet gone through the process of converting to Judaism. So it's almost like a person who's a, a Jewish monotheist without actually fully embracing Jewish practice. Now, when Peter arrives, Cornelius, out of deep respect, falls at Peter's feet and begins to worship him. This is a real turning of the tables because Cornelius is used to wielding the authority of the Roman Empire. He's used to people bowing before him, and now he, in turn, is bowing before Peter. Peter stops him immediately and says, get up, I too am just a man. And this is such a wonderful statement by Peter. It's a clear confession of mutuality. Peter wants to let Cornelius know, I'm no different than you. And so when all of these power systems are at work, Ro there's Roman power, Jewish individuals, there's Roman imperialism, all of these forces at work in this story, what we find are two men who've been called together, but they're not sure why. <laughs> and so all their superiority and their roles and relationships, they're all destabilized in this conversation. And that takes us really to a key passageway for this text, that the discernment of God's call always invites the next step. You know, oftentimes when we are trying to figure out what God is calling us to do, we want to know what God is calling us to do without actually acting on anything. We simply want to pray and reflect and hopefully God will, you know, take out a billboard or send us an ad online or something to tell us what to do. And these, these means of discerning God speaking are not invalid, but oftentimes what God is calling us to do is what I say is kinetic. In other words, there's an action, there's a next step that has to happen. And for Peter, this means the discernment about what is going on can only happen one step at a time. We learn in Acts 10 that Peter himself has a vision, and that vision that he has is about uh, in that case, about food, and it's about what God has called holy, let no one call unholy. Peter's being liberated in many ways from uh, Jewish kosher law in this vision, but he correctly interprets it in this story that this isn't just about food. This is about how he would be, let's say, around Gentiles. But in order for Peter to discern this, he has to take one step at a time. He's, he's got to receive Cornelius's messengers. He has to listen carefully to what they say. He has to agree to go with them. He has to go to Cornelius' house. He has to take a step into that house. He has to ask Cornelius why he's here. You see, all of these are actions he's taking. So the discernment that Peter is in is about taking one step at a time. 
And I think we have to remember that in our lives. If we're going to discern what God's call for us, even when it seems unusual and unorthodox, the best way to discern call sometimes is to simply take the next step in front of us. Now, once Peter arrives, there are some ground rules for this conversation that's about to take place. After this initial exchange between Peter and Cornelius, Peter actually now goes into the house and he finds Cornelius's entire house assembled. Now, the household for Cornelius would have been him, his immediate family members, maybe even extended family members, many of his servants, many of his aides, there are people who would be with him. And so he's gathered them all together, children, adults, everybody. And this fits very well with the way Luke uses household, not only in his gospel, but also in the book of Acts. He often, Luke often describes the conversion of not individuals, but he talks sometimes about the conversion of groups. And these texts like this uh, form some of the basis of the practice in the church of baptizing infants, that Peter baptized the household. Uh, there's this indication that somehow that all the members of the household receive baptism together. And so Peter then, in this conversation, offers them some clarity about how and why he is there. And he tells them that you know, it's forbidden for a Jewish man, for example, to associate with a foreigner. Now, there's nothing that bars this in Jewish scripture. In other words, if you scoured the Old Testament, you're not going to find any text that tells you that a Jewish man can't associate or visit with a foreigner. These were cultural and religious regulations that the Jewish community in Palestine had embraced. They were part of the Pharisaic tradition. And dining with Gentiles was especially problematic and was prohibited for Jews due to the possibility of violating kosher laws. They didn't know where the food came from or how it was prepared. So even though what the, the type of food presented to them may have been kosher, there can be no certainty that how that food was prepared kept with kosher law. And Peter here cites a quotation here from the vision he had when he was in Joppa, when this blanket of unclean foods was brought down before him. And, and the Lord said to him, rise and eat. And Peter says, no, no, I can't eat. This is unclean food. And then God says to him, and Peter quotes it here, God has shown me not to call any person unholy or unclean. This is because of that vision he had. So what Peter's done is he's taken a vision about food and he now interprets it correctly that it's not just about food, it's about people as well. There is no person who is unholy or unclean. The vision that Peter had in earlier in Acts chapter 10 is the pivot point for him. It's actually a conversion of his own relative to Cornelius' own conversion. His conversion ultimately from Roman paganism to be a God-fearing Gentile that would eventually lead him to becoming a follower of Jesus. This opens up another key passageway for us. Traditions become relative over time. You know, Peter is a devout Jew. He has held to a tradition and a custom of not associating with Gentiles. There are plenty of stories in the Gospels and especially in Luke's own Gospel of the disciples and Jesus associating with people that they were not supposed to be associating with according to cultural tradition and custom of their day. So this was likely, you know, a prohibition that had a, a, was good in practice at a certain point of time. But now this prohibition of Jews not even be able to go in the home of a Gentile has now become a hindrance to the gospel. We face today similar problems with traditions that surround us. Traditions can easily become barriers over time when traditions become detached from their purpose. In other words, we keep the practice, but the practice has no meaning. Then they're separate from their own context. So what we must remember is as much as we might value tradition, we must always be in the posture of questioning their value, their importance, why do we keep these traditions? Why do we keep these particular practices? And are they beneficial to us in any way in the moment in which we find ourselves? Now, once Peter asks why he's there, 
he, he uh, says in uh, verse 29, so I ask, for what reason did you send for me? And so then Cornelius explains why he has sent for Peter. Now, the vision Cornelius has is repeated in practically verbatim form. So if you were to read earlier in Acts 10, you would read the same version of these four verses of Scripture from verse 30 to verse 33 of Acts 10. Cornelius describes about how at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour, uh, and the same exact time in which they were standing there. In other words, they're standing there having this conversation at the same time of day when Cornelius had his vision. Cornelius says, I had an angelic vision, and the angel that appeared to me said that, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard, and your charitable, charitable gifts have been remembered before God. This is really interesting here. This angelic appearance affirms Cornelius's prayer and his gifts. There's an important linkage between these two, these two actions, thanksgiving, that's the prayer, and generosity, that's the gift. They're linked together. And so Cornelius says, I've been praying and dedicating my resources to my religious and spiritual life and the development of it. And so out of that, I was called to send for you, Peter. So Peter comes. And so Cornelius concludes this section of scripture that we read in Acts 10 by responding to Peter's question, for what reason have you sent for me? Cornelius says, well, we're here to hear what you have been commanded by the Lord. And so Peter, he hasn't been told to say anything. So if you go back to Acts chapter 10, verse 1, there's a no point in the story where Peter is given some kind of instruction about what he's supposed to say when he gets there. Peter asks, why am I here? And Cornelius says, we're here to hear what you have to say. And so there they are, standing, mutually waiting for something to happen. This opens up another key passageway for us here. Where God guides, God provides. Now, I heard Rick Warren say that statement many years ago. Rick Warren, of course, the senior, former senior pastor of Saddleback Church in Southern California. But I'm still convinced of how true it is. All God does in this episode, the Spirit brings together Peter and Cornelius. They've both been obedient. They've both been discerning. They've both been following the prompting of the Spirit. So now it's up to the Spirit of God to make this thing work. Peter is standing there. Why am I here? Cornelius says, we're here to hear what you have to say. They trust God with the outcome. And that's, why I think, something important for us to remember. When we're being guided by the Lord, we don't have to worry about doing the providing ourselves. God will provide. The focus isn't to focus on, the goal isn't to focus on what the provision will be. The focus is on obedience of following the Lord, and then God will provide. Trusting God with the outcome is the key to a life of faith. And so this is a situation of, that's, that's good looking to become great, that God is going to be the star of this story. Not Peter, not Cornelius. The spirit of the living God is going to be the star of this story. Now, finally, Peter speaks of his own transformation in verses 34 and 35. So it says in verse 34, opening his mouth, Peter said, and here's what comes out. I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. So Cornelius isn't the only one who's been transformed by this story. Peter states something revolutionary in this text, and I can't emphasize enough how revolutionary it is. He says, I most certainly understand. That in Greek, the way Luke writes this, that conveys the highest form of certainty that one has. I most certainly understand. The gluing together of these words in Greek is like, I know this 100%. There's no doubt in my mind about this. And what is it that he has no doubt about? God is not one to show partiality. The statement means that God finds favor based, does not find favor based on anyone's appearance. Acceptability is actually grounded, is what Peter says, in the one who fears God and does what is right. So the litmus test that happens here in Acts 10 is pivotal in the story. 
It's no longer whether one is Jewish or not, whether one's part of a certain covenant group of people by virtue of their ethnicity or birth. That system is now destabilized and in some ways done away with in Acts chapter 10. To be a true child of God isn't to be Jewish. It is to fear him and to do what is right. So justification and sanctification are the keys here, not who your mother was. Do, do we work then with God's spirit or not? Do we engage in our relationship by some sense of entitlement or not? And this is a key passageway for us. No matter of identity is a barrier to God's love. No partiality is important. God does not regard people unequally. We are all set on the same path. What matters is, is not our nature, not necessarily our background as much, our ethnicity, our culture, our tradition. What matters is our response to God's invitation to us. Grace upon grace. We are accepted unconditionally, yes, but we must also then accept the grace that God offers unconditionally. unconditionally. So in this sense, grace is only a gift When it's accepted, there is no matter of identity that's a barrier to God's love. We must remember that as followers of Jesus. If you have comments or reflections, I'd love to hear from you. Please visit my website at revcraig.com and click on news on the upper right-hand corner. And then you'll see a drop-down menu with podcasts on it. Click on podcast, and then you can click on this week's episode. You can leave a comment. I'd also encourage you to visit our church's website at ffmc.org, ffmc, First Free Methodist Church.org, to learn more about free Methodism and how you can connect with our community. For now, I bid you all grace. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.